bad about it before. So it used to be bad winds. Yeah, and then Beneventum is, okay. is good winds, fair winds, because fortunes had turned. They won a battle there. So does your family go all the way back to the Punic Wars? Is no, gosh, means? you can't keep track of any of that. Okay, okay. No, but the, the city does. The city okay. was founded in like the 4th century BC or something. Wow. So during the Roman Kingdom. Okay. Um, yeah, yeah. Man, what a, that's, but that's my family, I only know back until they got here in the in 1904. Okay, fantastic. So what, what they were up to before is a mystery. Oh, well, in that case, they may very well go all the way back to the Punic Wars. Yeah, maybe. well, I mean, technically all of our families go all the way back, right? <laughs> but, like, and keep track of them. Eh. Yeah, who knows? I mean, I'd, I'd like to think we're all royalty or all nobility of some sort if we go back far Somewhere, enough. Somewhere, yeah, you know, kingdom's the size of this classroom, but, you know. That's it, that's yeah. it. Every every man a king, every woman a queen. Yeah, yeah, we talk about Romulus and stuff, but he was probably like kind of like your libertarian squatter, right? <laughs> Somewhere in, in Nevada, he's like, this is the state of Jefferson. Uh, you know, it was a sovereign sovereign territory. No one, no one come in here because that's what they did, right? Like you, the real Romulus is probably not reared by a wolf or anything. It's probably some dude who got off a chain gang and set up in the hills and was like, this is my kingdom now. You know. And it just went really well after he killed his brother and, and a little bit of fratricide. That also never have happened, right? You know, Really? That, is yeah, that a doubted he, legend? Uh, he, we don't know anything about that period at all. All the records from the Roman kingdom were destroyed when Rome was sacked one of the times. Oh. So we don't actually... What we have is their mythology. And it could have been, you know, I'm a real tough guy. I killed my own brother, you know. Um, so it's, could, it's, it's possible. My goodness. It's possible. Man. But it's not, there's not that many aspersions cast on, on him. So so much mystery to the past. But I'm rambling. Oh, that's a great way to start our show. Welcome, ladies and gentlemen, to a special bonus episode of What's the Res? Normally, our show is focused on the ongoing conversation about the current resolutions of the world of high school debate. This episode is a little bit out of our ordinary rotation. Today, my guest is Christopher Rocchio, assistant editor at Bayon Books, graduate from North Carolina State University, and author of two science fiction novels in his series, The Sun Eater. Uh, I reached out to Christopher a few weeks ago in large part because, for two reasons. First, his novels are very, very good. I would strongly encourage you to pause the podcast, go to Amazon, buy both, and you'll be glad that you did by the time you finish them. Secondly, they are surprisingly literary for the sci-fi genre. Christopher, welcome to What's the Res? Well, thanks for having me. I'm glad to be here. Uh, it's, I, I really appreciate your, uh, your willingness to come out and your accessibility. I don't know many authors who would uh, answer a random Facebook message, hey, can I interview you? Yeah, well, I get fewer than you'd think. My, my parents like to think that now that I have a book in Barnes & Noble, or two, or four if you count the short story ones, um, that I'm famous, but it's not how it works. There's, a, there's an even longer road between where I am and George R. R. Martin than there was between having nothing and where I am now. So oh. it was, I'm just glad to be here. No, it's fantastic. Well, tell us a little about yourself. I, I, from the back of your book, I, the, the picture was taken when it looked like uh, when you were fresh out of college or, or at least implied that you were recently out of college, but I see that you're obviously no longer in college. Tell, tell us about where you are, what you're doing. and Yeah, what, well, what? so I, I got, there's a bit of a, a bit of a trick because I got a stonewalled a little bit on, on production of the book because I sold it about two weeks out of college. Um, I graduated December uh, 2015. I'd spent that whole year putting uh, query letters together trying to get an agent because it's what I wanted to do. And this is the first book. This is the first book. Yeah, this was 2015. I finished writing it in like March, and then I spent the rest of the year trying to get an agent, and it took me until November, by which point, uh, you know, no one's working, especially in publishing, no one's working in December. You get the holidays and stuff. So I took a, took a month, did some edits. My agent requested over the holidays, got it together. And I think it was like January 18th. So I was out of college four weeks, five weeks, maybe a month, uh, somewhere in there. And we sold the book. It was also the same week I got my job working for Bain, different, you know, different publishing company. Uh, so it was a good week. Um, <laughs> but then one thing and another, my first editor, the lady who acquired the book in the first place, quit. Um, mm. Like 10 months in, she went to get a job at another publisher. Um, abandoned me, Sarah! Um, and uh, uh, so it sat on it sat in a shelf for a little while. And finally, the publisher got the wheels going again. So I put in the, the, the bio that I sold my first book at 22, but it was published when I was 25. I see. Because um, I, I was just barely, I was about to turn 23 when I sold it. So uh, it's, you know, if you can fudge the numbers in any way possible to make yourself sound better, you should. Okay, okay. <laughs> so they're, they're, they're definitely, it sounds like you've already cracked the, uh, the, the nut of it is about marketing to some extent. 
Yeah, well, you know, we were just talking about Romulus before all this. You, if you can mythologize yourself even a little bit, especially in anything approaching show business, which literature kind of is, um, it helps, right? So if you can be a year younger, if you possibly get that sort of thing in there, cool. Uh, when I was writing my query letter, there's a famous science fiction uh, writer's workshop called Clarion, um, and I have not been to Clarion, but the professor, uh, John Kessel of NC State, who taught me, was a Clarion professor. So when I wrote the letter, I was like, I studied under a uh, former Clarion teacher, you know, John Kessel. Mm -hmm. Not lying in any way possible, but if you get the word Clarion in there, it rattles around people's heads a little bit. And my agent has since copped to the fact that that was a factor she considered. Interesting. Okay, so there's there's a bit of rhetoric involved, just in, even in getting people to help you out with the publication process. Yeah, if you can, especially because I had no credentials, right? I was just an English student, and I was what uh, twenty one, twenty two when I was doing all this querying and writing. I had no former credits, right? You see this with like resumes, right? Like it's an entry level job, but we need ten years of experience. Uh, is the, <laughs> so is, the old, is the old joke, right? And I'm sure you know. You've seen, maybe some of your audience have seen stuff like that too, right? You know, even if it's just waiting tables, sometimes they'll want, yeah. you know, a lot of, so if you can fudge anything, because once you're in the door, then a lot of that matters less because they're working with you as a person. Right. And again, don't lie, but if you can, you can spin things a little bit, um, you know, not maliciously, um, then, Interesting. then it's, then it's useful. Uh, again, uh, don't, don't, don't lie. Like I remember Neil Gaiman used to say that he'd published things he hadn't published back in like the 80s and stuff, because no one could check him. So he'd be like, yeah, I have two articles in the New York Times. No one's going through a card catalog in the library trying to find things. So Neil Gaiman used to fabricate publications to get started. Um, wow. And he's a, he's a legend. He is a legend. I, I have a deep love for uh, his Sandman novels, and uh, I, I haven't yet watched season two of American Gods, but I love his, uh, his, his way of thinking about mythology is beautiful. Yeah. At the same time, it doesn't... His... his approach to writing and his, for him, at least in his literature, truth is never quite as factual as, as one might wish. And so I wouldn't be quite surprised to hear him yeah. and he's, take that same approach. He's the one who's mythologized a lot of stuff about himself too, whether or not it's true. But like he, you know, I don't, I don't know if he actually writes everything longhand, but he claims that he writes all of his manuscripts with, with a fountain pen in, in a manuscript. I, I believe it. I don't. I don't know Neil Gaiman. I haven't met him, but uh, maybe he'll listen but, to the show and call us both. I mean, that would be amazing. Maybe, and I, you know, don't quote me on that fabricating, uh, you know, news clippings thing. I don't remember where I read that. It sure, was years ago. So it could have been someone making stuff up. But even if it's you know not true, it's still suggestive of something about him that makes him larger than life. And if you are in show business at all, like look at like rock stars, right? Uh, uh, Alice Cooper did not drink a chicken's blood on stage. Um, he was accused of having done that at one point in the 70s. And Frank Zappa told him, never deny it, right? Because you want people to think that's real. Uh, he didn't do that. There was a chicken that had got on stage and he threw it back into the audience. and They, they crushed it in the mosh pit. There's a, uh, there's a poem by uh, B.H. Fairchild. It has one of the lines that I love. I, I found this in, uh, in college and just have loved it ever since. Uh, the facts are true. Uh, but the facts are not the truth. And it seems that that's, that's something of the idea there, that the, the idea, the fact of someone being larger than life may very well be true, but the actual factual occurrences aren't the totality. Aren't, aren't necessarily true. And, you know, it's sort of, we talk about fiction telling truths, right? And fiction's all lies, right? You know, uh, even, even realistic fiction, you know, Jane Austen's characters didn't actually exist, even though people like them certainly did. Um, and even things cr that are crazy, like Star Wars tells a kind of true story about heroism and about redemption and about, you know, the right way to act and all these things and resisting evil. And, and aspects of that are real and things you can take away in your everyday life. And that's kind of, you know, stuff that all writers touch on, you know, myself included, even though there is no galaxy far, far away, there is no force, there are no Jedi but you know people like Luke, and you want to be like him, right? Or like Ray or Anakin sometimes. Sometimes. Um, you know, because even Anakin, you know, he has a bit... We are all kind of like Anakin. We have those terrible phases of our lives, even though hopefully we're not becoming uh, Darth Vader. Hopefully. Certainly hopefully not. Well, does... That how does all of this, does, does writing, on, does your own writing affect your work as an editor or as an assistant editor? What, 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 how do those things relate? Not, do not, a, not in any technical sense. Uh, like I haven't learned to write books differently 
because I, have, I work with other writers. Uh, what I have learned uh, working on either side of the author-editor relationship is how to be a better writer for my editor and vice versa. Mm. Um, you would not believe the number of writers, and I won't throw anyone under the bus who can't answer emails or who don't answer emails on time, or you'll ask them four questions and they'll answer the second one, right? You know, the, the just people, there's a, there are a lot of soft professional skills people don't teach you, like clear communication, and timeliness, um, especially with artists, because artists do believe a lot of the myths about themselves, which you should never do. You should always try to keep your head on straight, even if everyone else is confused. Um, they will start to think, well, you know, I am New York Times number one bestseller, insert name here. Uh, if I don't need to be edited, you know, I don't need to, I don't need to be on time, they'll work with me, right? Which is true because if, if, if George Martin puts out the next Game of Thrones book tomorrow and it's literally four pages that says, haha, everyone dies, uh, <laughs> the end, it'll still move a million <laughs> copies. Um, the minute uh, Bantam Books gets that manuscript, they know that they have their Christmas bonuses squared away for ages, right? And they'll be able to, to pay for – because publishers also use big sellers like that to, um, to subsidize all their new experimental writers. Because we have no way of knowing which new writer is going to catch on. So you have to count on your big successes to pay for things. And if you can't be on time, sometimes uh, you can't pick up new authors. Sometimes you have to lay people off. Because um, uh, publishing is a pretty thin margin business, right? You, like you lose money if these big books don't sell. Uh, I don't know if that's something that happened with Game of Thrones or not. I don't know of anyone attached to it. But these soft skills, like being on time, really, I, I can't stress that enough. With something, mm. the the impact of a late manuscript on the office um, is so catastrophic um, that it has taught me to really, really worry about that sort of thing. Because uh, we get very upset when authors cause these problems and it makes us, unless they're a really big deal, um, really struggle to work with them sometimes. Interesting. Um, and so mostly in having a foot on both sides of the door like this, I've learned the right way to act as a professional in the industry. At least I hope I have. Um, more than I've learned, you know, oh, don't write this way, maybe do this style differently, that sort of thing. Um, I don't know if you can teach craft, but I, I that that's always been a, that's also been a thought in the back of my mind for years. I ran across a Mark Helprin introduction that he written to someone else's book where he just makes the straight up claim that you can't teach writing. That you either have it or you don't. You can polish somebody's gift if they have it, but he thinks it's just something that springs from within. But I think it's always fascinating the picture you're giving us of a kind of a, a we we the normal public, I don't think, I know I certainly don't see this side of writing. I just see, oh, one of my favorite authors has a new book. It's right. at Barnes and Noble, or I see a banner ad on, on Amazon. I'm like, oh, buy that. And it, boom, it shows up in two days. Yeah. Nobody, because it's art, right? People don't think about it being a business, which is unfortunate, right? In, in Renaissance Italy, right? When you had all these, you know, uh, aristocrats who could bankroll Leonardo da Vinci and Michelangelo, people who could literally spend their whole lives creating these amazing masterpieces. They didn't have to worry about food, things like that. They didn't have to worry about the Medici you know, financial empire collapsing because they didn't deliver a painting, right? Um, then they had the luxury of time, although they didn't because if they didn't deliver, Lorenzo de' Medici might kill you or, you know... Uh, Small problems. You know, something might happen, but they had a different different set of issues under that system. Now, because of the churn, because it is a business, right? You, especially if you're a new writer, you can't afford to be, if I, if I took eight years to deliver a book, um, no one would turn up for it because uh, no one knows who I am and I have to build my name on timeliness, right? There are like, um, there are a few ways to be successful artistically. Quantity is the least talked about one. Um, if you turn out material, no matter how good it is, regularly and dependably, uh, you will have an audience, right? If you look at a lot of indie writers, they'll put out a book every like three months and they're very short hmm. um, and they aren't very well edited and some of them aren't even well written to begin with, but they're there reliably. People will keep buying them because they liked it enough to read whatever they've got. Now that is not, you know, that's not the sort of noble vision of the artist as this, you know, like architect of the human soul, discovering corners of, of human existence, right? But uh, it, is a, it is someone who has a career. And if you can be an architect of the soul and 
produce quickly, um, then you've really got a career. And at minimum, producing consistently, reliably, and professionally will get you a lot of places. Hmm. Um, because it is a business. Yeah. One author that comes to mind when you said that is, uh, is Jim Butcher. Uh, I know Jim. Do you? Yeah, yeah. Do you um, know? The pen I signed with, he gave me actually like three weeks ago. That's amazing. Um, he was like, you got to get one of these. This is the best pen for signing books with. This He's, is going to be my new three degrees of separation story. Yeah. <laughs> I met a guy who knows Jim Butcher. He, he's really nice. I, I like Jim a lot. Is he ever going to finish book 18? Uh, Peace Talks? Yes. It's done. It's done. It's done. It oh! is, it's not scheduled, uh, but his editor has okay, it. Good. He just turned it in like two weeks ago. I have just been, mm -hmm. I have checked his website about every two or three months. I'll be like, surely it's I dead. think the update's up there now. Oh, but that's he, so he has good. delivered it. It is on its way. Uh, it was really uncomfortable. I have not read a lot of Dresden books. I read like the first two like, ages ago, like when the TV show came he out. Gets a, the TV show is terrible. I saw it first, so I don't oh. have a problem with it. Okay. Um, but, oh, and, the actor uh, they picked for that. But anyway. Yeah. But, I, you know, I again, I saw it first, but... Uh, I was sitting at this booth right between two stacks of Jim Butcher books with my one book, and people kept walking I'm like, "When's Peace Talks coming?" I'm like, "I do not work for Jim Butcher. Uh, he's not here right now. Um, I don't know anything about wizards in Chicago." Um, they, they, if you if you ever do go back and work through it, uh, I will say the the initial books are obviously early books, and and I'm. Your books did not strike me that way, but most people I've read who write in quantity, I, I can see that an editor took a risk on the first book or two, but by, in his case, books really three or four, he's clearly found his voice and his niche. That's, uh, that's what I hear. And now, yeah, you mentioned Empire is weird, right? Empire of Silence is my first book, because it is a first book, but it's also not. Okay. Uh, because I, uh, I've been writing since I was eight. Um, we used to we used to play make believe recess as kids too, right? Because um, I was one of those kids, uh, and my friends were playing Dragon Ball Z because it was you know it was the '90s and Dragon Ball Z was huge, but I wasn't allowed to watch it, so I didn't know what that was. So I could play with them on the condition that I was Batman, and we <laughs> over a, a, as we went through first, second, third grade, right? We stopped being Goku, Vegeta, and Batman, and we became our own like weird sort of you know orig original characters. Um, and uh, they all dropped out and started playing football and having social skills. And uh, I stayed inside at recess and started actually writing these things down. And so there's this weird, I don't know if you, you know the ship of Theseus problem, right? Where you replace all the parts in the, in the ship one at a time. Um, one by one, Empire of Silence has grown out of being Batman stories that I wrote on the back of my notes. Now, there is virtually nothing of Batman left in it, right? Except maybe Hadrian has a black cape. Um, but uh, it all started. It all started with that. So I've been writing the same book over and over and over since I was eight years old. Okay. Uh, and I I don't even know how many times I've written it, which makes writing books two and three weird because I always only thought about what might happen later. Now I'm doing it so fast by comparison because I wrote you know Empire since I was eight and I was twenty two when I finished it, and then book three came out in the next year. Uh, book two came out in the next year, and then three. And then I got to keep doing it. Uh, if it's any consolation from at least my point of view as the reader, I thought book two was uh, was equally well done as book one. I didn't see kind of a drop off in in storyline or plotting or well, character development or any of those things that sometimes happen with in between books. Yeah, part of that is that creators will have this one idea, right? I don't know if you're a true detective fan. Um, TV show. It's a detective anthology series. Okay. Each season's its own thing. The first season is a masterpiece, right? Matthew McConaughey, Woody Harrelson. Uh, brilliant serial killer story. The second one is uh, uh, Taylor Kitsch and Rachel McAdams, a couple other people, and it's like a diamond heist, and it's fine. If it had come out first, people were like, this is a good show. And then the second season, having, you know, would have been, would have blown them away. But it's only okay, and it's, I think, because the creator had been noodling over this one story and tweaking it for years and years and years, that I he see. blew all that energy on that story. And a lot of people will do that. You see this with, like, uh, you see this with musicians all the time. Their, their break album is a masterpiece, and then the second one's just not. Mm -hmm. um, and uh, sometimes they'll course correct by the third one, right? And then, then you know that you still got a career because you can you can bear a mistake early on, right? But you know, well, let's let's back up just a little bit because I I was initially intrigued when I read your bio at the back of Empire of Storms by this one line 
It reads, uh, Christopher, quote, is a graduate of North Carolina State University where a penchant for self-destructive decision-making caused him to pursue a bachelor's in English rhetoric with a minor in classics. <laughs> How on – I mean, so – so you're sitting here in my classroom as we're recording. I've had, I think at this point, I have three students who have gone on to NC State. All three of them have gone with engineering goals. One of them is no longer interested in engineering. He thinks he might do something with American history. Okay. But at least from my point of view, NC State is where you go if you want to be an engineer, if you want to go into like textiles. If you, It's all this... Tech, totally trade, business, yeah, yeah. yeah, agriculture. So how did you end up there? All noble pursuits. Um, I, NC State, people don't know this. The College of Humanities and Social Sciences actually has a sterling reputation. It's a, it's a great college. Uh, it is overshadowed because UNC is very close and is a very humanities-driven school. Right? They have the law school and everything, uh, and by Duke, which is Duke. Um, and, but it's it's perfectly good program. They have this internship program, um, and that's why I wanted to go there, uh, that had a 100% job placement rate Oh, for English students. Uh, and I may have made a you know bit of a crazy choice going for an English degree in 2019 AD, uh, but uh, the job placement thing was was pretty was pretty telling. I thought that would be I thought that'd be a good move, and it worked out because actually that's where I got I got placed with Bain. I told them what I was looking for. I was going to work with a couple small presses online doing publishing, you know, editorial stuff. Um, but they were like, you know there's like a real, air quotes, publisher that's that's here, right? They move from New York. I was like, what? And I'm like, yeah, they do science fiction. And they're like, double what? Uh, so I went and, and got that, and I got the job, so it ended up working out. Their reputation uh, is unbroken, or, you know, as far as I know. Um, and uh, But, yeah, you know, you get the engineering students over, and they're always like, oh, you're in English. What do you want to be a waiter? And I'm like, actually, I am right now, and I make more money than you because <laughs> you're sitting here noodling at your computer at 3 a.m., not doing anything, um, you know, but uh, it's, that's people in college, right? They all have their opinions. Right, um, right. Yeah, so, so you went there intending. You knew English was the route you wanted to go. Yeah, I put all my eggs in one basket, really. Um, I have known I wanted to write since I realized I was not good enough at math to be an astronaut, um, or physical fitness for that matter. Um, and so that was around age eight. I was like, yeah, I'll just I'll figure out how to do this. And I had no idea what I was doing, and nobody really does, um, because writing is so opaque. You know, how, how to get into the industry is something that no one explains mm. um, very well. It's like getting into music, right? Actually, it works the same way. You have to find agents, and how you find them, like, are they under, are they under the mat? I don't know. Um, uh, but I, I did. I put, all, I put all my efforts into figuring that one out. And NC State also had a creative writing professor, John Kessel, who's a, a two-time Nebula Award winner uh, for a couple short stories he did back in the day. He's got some books with Saga Press, an all-around nice guy. Um, and he, uh, he, was, he was there, and his being there it was explained to me in, uh, not a orientation, but like when I was walking around, they were like, oh, you know, we've got this guy here, right? And so that was a factor, too. And John did help me write my query letter. Uh, which helped me get an agent and helped me. He gave me some suggestions that that helped point me along, uh, despite our many disagreements. Oh, excellent! Uh, <laughs> those are those are some of the best kinds of yeah. uh, professor-student interactions, I'm sure. No, John's great. Well, tell me what what authors have most influenced you over the years? Um, like in science fiction or just overall sci-fi um, in general? Because you you name drop Jane Austen earlier, and and I know you're I know you're a big mythology guy. It sounds like yeah. So there really are there are two camps, right? They're the the science fiction fantasy stuff. Because if I'm reading for fun, I I hate reading literary fiction, right? Stuff that's just you know, oh, let me tell you about the you know the dismal life of this steel worker in the 1950s, and is like I can't I can't read Tennessee Williams, right? Like, yeah, it's a play, so you shouldn't read it to begin with. But it's just dismal stuff, right? Uh, there's not much hope there. That's, there's that's and, and there's nothing to aspire to, right? Like you don't want to be Stanley, heavens, um, you know. So I want to read stories about heroes, right? So I read I, I, Tolkien is still the, the biggest influence on me, and you'll hear that from a lot of people who write science fiction or fantasy. There is not a better fantasy book than Lord of the Rings, and I am—I struggle to believe there will be a better one. Mm. Um, Tolkien is a in a league of his own. Um, Frank Herbert Dune—that um, was a big influence uh, as well. Writers like Ian Banks and Lois McMaster Bujold, although she was a more recent one. Uh, so was Gene Wolfe. I only discovered him after I'd written uh, Empire Silence, uh, which was good because we're very similar in some ways. 
Um, Patrick Rothfuss, too. Mm. Uh, I like Name of the Wind a lot. The second one, not as much. Um, He's another one that I'm still waiting on, book three. Yeah. yeah I read yeah. his little novella. I, 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 I had trouble understanding his, the novella. I, it's, it's very poetic, um, and I'm not sure what it's trying to do either. Um, but my understanding is that he's, I mean, he's, he's got a lot going on. Um, I don't know much more about that, but, uh, um, but then there are also the, uh, the sort of canon writers, right? And I am the sort of person who thinks that these great texts matter, right? As if we're still reading something 2,000 years after it was, it was written, right? And the Greek plays were only performed once, right? Uh, Oedipus Rex is only on stage in Athens once, and we're still reading it, right? It's because it, it matters. There's something there that's important. Now, part of that is that it's a cultural inheritance, right? Um, but part of it, too, is that there is, there is a certain, you know, je ne sais quoi to it. It, 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 it is that good. And now, I can't read it in the original Greek, but it is, it, even in the English, right, if you get the right translation. It's, oh, we, I teach that one. Or I have taught that uh, to three different groups of ninth graders over the years. And even... Ooh, that's a rough one for ninth graders. Oh, well, and our, our, our sequence is, uh, so we're a classical school. We do a lot of, our literature is structured through a great books approach. So ninth grade is, Greco, is ancient Near East, Greco-Roman. And then 10th grade is Roman medieval, 11th grade is modern Europe, and then um, 12th grade is American stuff. Cool. But uh, so we, 9th grade is like, it's, it's a little hard to bite that bullet to convince kids. You do have to read, you're reading something that was eh, between four and 3,000 years ago, and we're not quite sure how old it is, but it's old. Yeah, about 2,400. Yeah. They still, uh, for Oedipus particularly, I mean, it's just the, still, the, the turn at the end, or they, they get so fascinated by Oedipus discovering all these things about himself. Yeah, it's, well, it's, it's bleak, but it's bleak in, it's, it, it, Sophocles, is, he's just he's really good. Him, Aeschylus, I'm not as much of a Euripides fan, mm. um, mostly because we don't really have anything in, like, a complete sequence, you know? Um, sure. We've got, like, random plays from the middle of trilogies and stuff, and, and it's... It's not like, you know, we don't have the whole, like, like we do have the whole Oris Dea, right? Mm -hmm. Which is one of my favorite pieces of the literature. Um, to a lesser extent, philosophical texts from the same period. Uh, my, my best friend is a uh, classical philosophy professor at Princeton. Mm. Uh, we grew up together. He just got his PhD, um, uh, Marcus Gibson. Uh, and uh, he, uh, he, he helps me with a lot of the philosophical angle because most of what I've done is literary and dramatic. Um, but then, you know, Dante is a big influence, um, and, and uh, Milton, Shakespeare. I did a whole bunch of Elizabethan theater stuff when I was in school. Okay. Um, Johnson and Marlowe and, and, and the rest. Um, so, yeah, broadly those, those two camps there. And I don't think that one is necessarily of better quality than the other. I think we'll read Tolkien in 500 years. Mm. Uh, I think we, he may be the only fantasy writer from the last, you know, from this, from this genre movement that we read in 500 years, but we'll definitely read him. And so, I, you know, I'll drop references to Dante and Tolkien in the same paragraph when I'm writing a book, and I don't think that one is of greater value than the other. I think, uh, I don't know if you're familiar with a guy named Brad Berzer. At, uh, he's, a, he's a history professor at Hillsdale College, but he wrote a, he wrote a, a biography of Tolkien. He does, he loves doing historical biographies. And I remember him at one point dreaming about uh, if he could design the perfect literature course. And he's a history prof, dreaming about a literature course. He always liked pairing a book from the time period that he was studying, from literature, to, uh, with the, the history. But uh, he, would, he said he would do it as um, he'd have students read the Iliad, no, the Odyssey, the Aeneid, the Divine Comedy, and Lord of the Rings. And those would just be his four books and that would be like one semester, uh, maybe either one semester or one year. Here is the West in a single course with four epic poems. I think that's about right. There is uh, the audiobooks. That he also on. loves Batman. Just to toss that Batman in. Batman is the best superhero, and anyone <laughs> who says differently is not read closely enough. Um, but uh, the audiobooks for Lord of the Rings recorded books put together in the 90s. The CDs, the back, say, I don't remember the context, but it got to this point where it said uh, Chaucer, Shakespeare, Dickens, Tolkien. Hmm. Um, as like the big four English writers. And that's a pretty bold claim, but I, I think it will bear out in the next couple hundred years. Hmm. Well, I know certainly there's been plenty of folks who have written their book only to be called kind of dim shadows of, of Tolkien and 
so much of the fantasy genre has seemed to just kind of be attempts to echo the master in that sense. Yeah, they can't get out of the king. Well, you have this, right? Every genre is pioneered by a couple, you know, absolute geniuses, right? Like a uh, music example. Uh, Black Sabbath, uh, the the lead uh, lead guitarist Tony Iommi, um, who actually owns the band, it's not Ozzy's band, uh, lost the tips of his two middle fingers on his left hand in a machining accident. He was a machinist right okay. after they sold the first album, um, which of course should have ended his career because that's the finger you're you know you're not strumming with. I can't remember picking. Picking, yeah. Sorry. Um, but he, he put a couple thimbles on his fingers and uh, and has played with that for twenty albums. Uh, That's where that comes from? I've seen so different the, guys do the that. The reason, no, no, not the thimbles. There are people who do that just to protect oh, okay. the fingers from getting cut. But he wears a couple thimbles on the end of his fingers because he couldn't reach the strings otherwise. And the reason, uh, one of the things that he had to do was he had to tune the guitars down to loosen the strings so that he could actually hit them properly. So that really low, doomy sound um, that creates the sort of template for heavy metal music as a consequence of his having lost the tips of his fingers. Huh. And a bunch of people emulate. That was sort of a cosmic accident, right? But you get people who will just play something differently, right? Or they'll write something different. And what Tolkien did was, in all of that world building, right? Building Middle Earth from the languages up, no one had really done before, certainly not on that scale. And now every single person who wants to be a fantasy writer that comes after that thinks, I need to invent 12 languages and 5,000 years of history. No, you don't. Um, you are not Tolkien. You don't have to act like Tolkien. All you have to do is write a book. And if all the world building you do is what's on the page, that's fine. Very often, I will create an entire planet for one sentence. And I don't know anything else about it except that it's called this, and maybe it has this one feature, right? Like, there's a school there that's important, or there is a mountain, um, and I don't know anything else about it. But readers will think you know everything. Um, because readers, for whatever reason, think that authors know a lot more than they do. And this is like I was saying at the beginning, all you have to know is what's on the page, right? You can mythologize the rest of it. Um, I don't know... 20,000 years of imperial history, right, in this in this series. I know what's mentioned. Um, so, so you don't, so you're perfectly, that was one of the things I wanted to get, I was wanted to ask you about your series, because you seem to leave a, I, I was particularly intrigued by the dream slash vision sequences that Hadrian has. Yeah. And, I mean, there's part of it that I think you explain, in the context, and you, you give us enough hints that we, okay, I clearly see where this is sort of building to. Yeah, and you'll, give, and you'll get more as you go. Yeah, yeah, yeah. But there's a lot that seems to me to be left intentionally mysterious. Yes. And is that, or, or do you know what the, what it all is, or are you just mm -hmm. kind of leaving it there? I know some of it, because some of it I have to work with. And, yeah. and this is a book, too, that's written like a memoir, right? So on page one, I tell you part of how it ends. Mm -hmm. um, and then I start you in a place that's very different, and so that you're like, well, how the heck are we going to get from A to B, right? But there is also a lot that I don't want to tell you that I know okay. because questions are better than answers, especially in literature. Uh, you can give someone a question, then they can argue about it sometimes for centuries, right? Like the way Hamlet's ghost, father's ghost behaves in Hamlet, right, is inconsistent. Everybody can see it in the first scene. When it appears in Act 3, only Hamlet can see it. Right. So why? Right? Is the ghost maliciously trying to destroy his own son by making him look crazy? Uh, is it fading away because the ghost's you know, closer to being avenged? Right? And is it leaving this mortal coil and appears in rags instead of armor glowing? Right? Um, why? Why? And we argue about this constantly. And the argument helps keep the book alive, or the play alive in this case. Okay. And okay. so it's good to keep questions. It's called um, strategic opacity, or strategically opaque. Right? And some of it, I just don't know. And it's okay that I don't know because I know people will argue about it. Um, or I hope people will argue about that it. That is fascinating. I think I've probably been, in, I have for years, I've been in the, uh, the authorial intent camp entirely in terms of how do you determine what a text means. But I took a class last year that moved, we, we read a guy, a German philosopher named Hans Gadamer, that convinced me that there needs to be a text sort of lives... Like the author gives birth to a text in that very uh, Socratic, uh, the, the philosopher is the midwife to the idea kind of way. But once the text is then gone, the text sort of takes on a life of its own. And it's sort of independent, not completely independent from the author, but sort of. I, I do tend to break with the death of the author thing, though, because 
Oh yeah, people take that. The, people, to a people vast. like I can make this mean whatever I want, right? Taming the Shrew is a feminist play. No, it's not. <laughs> it's not. It's a blue collar <laughs> entertainment play for a bunch of blue collar guys in the 1600s who were henpecked by their wives, and they need something to laugh at. Um, it's deeply uncomfortable, um, particularly to modern audience. But there are people who try to reclaim it again, air quotes, as a feminist piece. It's certainly not. You can't twist words into I mean, plays and books into meaning whatever you want. I think that authors certainly have an intention, and the right way to do literary criticism is to understand what that intention is, and then to evaluate whether or not the text succeeds in that intention. Mm. Um, Fahrenheit 451 is a classic case of this, because Ray Bradbury used to walk out of talks and lectures he was doing if people said the book was about censorship. Uh, he insisted to his dying day that book has nothing to do with censorship. He said that book is about the damage that television is doing to American culture. Um, which, if you look at the book, makes perfect sense. I don't think it communicates that very clearly. I need to go back and reread um, Fahrenheit 451 now. Yeah, it, it's great, but it doesn't communicate that very well. So if you're T.S. Eliot reading that, you'd say that's a dramatic failure, right? Because it doesn't accomplish the author's stated intention. Um, it's still a great, it's still a great book because what literature is, right? We say a picture is worth a thousand words, but literature is composed of words that can say multiple things. Um, because you're not, if you're a really good writer, you're not walking in and saying, "Here are my beliefs, uh, here's my manifesto." You're not writing uh, an essay. You're not giving a speech. You're trying to depict the world as it is, and that way you can give credence to. Uh, ideas that might be in competition with one another. If you look at like Dostoevsky, right, the great Russian novelist, um, he uh, he um, will have. Sorry, the music came to me. Oh yeah, it's okay. Um, yeah, so Dostoevsky will have these uh, will have competing threads, right? Ivan is this brilliant dogmatic atheist, right, and his brother Alyosha is simple-minded, can't argue right. uh, at all. Uh, with his with his brilliant brother, but he's and he's devoutly religious, so he looks like an idiot in all of his arguments with Ivan. So if you read that book at a very surface level, you're like, oh, uh, Dostoevsky's an atheist. He thinks that religious people are foolish, like Alyosha. Ivan is who I want to be, but Ivan ends up miserable, right? Doesn't ever say, oh, Ivan was a fool, and ha ha, he pays for his foolishness. Um, right. But Alyosha ends up happy in the end, and Ivan ends up broken. Um, and it, he carries that message by depicting what happens to them in their lives, not by letting them win their individual debates with one another. And so literature I is able see. to do both at the same time. And so if you're a really good writer, you can represent something, which may be your point of view, and may include points of view you're not sympathetic to at all, which is why it's really foolish when uh, writers get in trouble for, um, like, you see this all the time, some villain will have done something, uh, will said something unspeakable, right, in, in, a, in a movie. I think, like, there was one recently about how Pennywise, like, killed the gay character in It. I don't know anything about It. Uh, I just saw the headline. Right. I haven't seen It. I haven't read It. Um, but I know Pennywise is the bad guy, so whatever he's doing is probably not something we're supposed to look up to, right? And so whenever people come out of reading something or watching a movie and they say, ah, this part upset me, well, maybe it was supposed to. Maybe that was the bad part, right? All you're supposed to be doing when you're writing is depicting a species of the world as it is or as you hope it might be and trying to have characters act in such a way. Sometimes that you can say 12 or 15 things at once. And people will take away different things. You can find people who like Lord of, the, Lord of the Rings is a great example. Lord of the Rings became popular in the 70s because Led Zeppelin made a lot of songs about it and got real popular with the hippie crowd. All right? Hippie, you know, stoners, you know, free love, lefty hippies, 19, right, 1960s, right. right? Tolkien was a dogmatic conservative Catholic, right? And if people as different as that can both appreciate the same work, then it's a great work because everybody likes it even if for different reasons. So you have all these like stoner hippies who are trying to raise people, you know, in you know like like the like Lord of the Rings characters would like, right? Because those are all noble heroes. Those are Catholic, you know, character characters are behaving in a Catholic kind of way, mm -hmm. right? That are admired by people who don't like Catholicism at all, right? And so the work transcends a lot of these physical real world boundaries because it manages to say so many different things. So it's way it's got way more uh, pixels, like it's even higher resolution than a picture has, right? It's doing way more than a thousand words, even though it's made of words.
Fascinating. Well, let's let's take this to be a bit more specific about about your book. Sure. So uh, the series is called The Sun Eater, and we've got two volumes, one and two, currently out and available. Um, so without giving any spoilers, could you describe the overall story arc? Yeah. So The Sun Eater is set about twenty thousand years in the future, our future, um, and it's a story of a guy called Hadrian. And Hadrian is a nobleman. He runs away from home. He's uh, trying to get away from his father who wants him to be a torturer uh, for the judiciary. And uh, he gets stuck in the middle of this war between the human empire and the first aliens, uh, the Sielsen, who have ever stood up to the empire in 20,000 years. The first aliens who have ever been advanced enough to combat humanity. Uh, Hadrian tells you page one, it is written like a memoir, that he's the guy who ended that war and killed all of the Sielsen. And this is why and how and about all the things nobody knows. I like to say jokingly when I'm at conventions, it's like Star Wars if Anakin being Darth Vader was his best option. Um, <laughs> and that actually usually gets people to pick it up. But I, I can see that now that you say that. Because he does have, I mean, he, he's almost, an, I, the way you develop his character throughout that first book, I mean, it's, or really throughout the first two books, he's, so, he's got so much naivety, naivete in so many different areas that seems to get worn off as he goes through these different, different experiences. Yeah, because, yeah, I mean, he's got, I always joke, when, when I say that to people at shows, when it's like Anakin, I'm like, and he really is like Anakin in this first one, right? Di nothing about sand, you know, no, no, no sand jokes, uh, but, uh, but he really does. He, he has to grow into all of this, and this is a character who lives for hundreds of years, right? So he, he, if he's the same in book one as in book five, and if he's brilliant in book five, then he has nowhere to go. Right, so okay. he has he gets in his own way a lot. He makes a lot of mistakes. We all do, um, but he is trying to figure out his place in this often bleak and dangerous world. Um, but doing that, you know, with ray guns and with swords that can cut through anything, and and you know, robots. And so you've got Hadrian then, and you've got uh, twenty thousand years in the future, mm -hmm. and he's going to kill all of the. How did you pronounce this? Cielsen. Cielsen. Yeah. Okay, cool. Now, what's the I, one of the things I found really fascinating was your kind of adaptation, I guess, of the ancient Roman kind of uh, method of dividing up civilization. You've got uh, you've got the Palatines and we've got the Plebeians. Right. Did you draw that consciously from Rome, or is there some other origin uh, to that division? Well, yes, yes, and no. Because the the Romans, of course, had patricians. They had uh, and they had uh, the Plebeians. And the imperial caste system has got a little bit more extra steps. Uh, the Palatines are the sort of genetic elite nobility. They live for hundreds of years. Uh, they're smarter than normal humans. They're faster, taller, more attractive. You know, they're the result of a lot of genetic therapy. And they have these huge um, uh, family clans that have dominated space for millennia. And uh, they also, uh, the downside, of course, is they can't have children uh, without help because their genomes are so complicated. And so they're also all literally hostage to the emperor um, who can refuse to grant them permission to have uh, another generation at any point so they can't rebel. So even though they are you know, all powerful within a certain context, they're also deeply vulnerable, um, uh, which is kind of true of nobility. There's this great scene in Conan the Barbarian where King Osric says uh, that the throne is a prison and that's sort of something the whole book plays with, too, is people think it's a privilege to be the king. It's terrible. Um, I think 25% of Roman emperors were assassinated. I think it's something like 18% of all European monarchs ever were killed. Um, it has a higher death rate than like most like manual labor jobs, like construction. The only, I think the only profession that dies more frequently are soldiers, for the obvious reason. Um, terrible job. Um, as far as the, the patricians, the patricians are... Um, in, in, the, in my empire, are common humans who've been uplifted surgically. They're given uh, genetic therapies after they're born. Uh, so they're mm. sort of like middle class. So they, don't oh, quite, they don't quite have all of the benefits of being Palatine. They might still be able to have children on their own. Whereas the Plebeians are you and I. They're just pure, unmodified humans. And they live the normal amount of time. They live on planets very often. They don't have a license to leave the planet they're born on. Um, and even though this sounds tyrannical, they have a whole planet to live on. We have a whole planet to live on right now, and it's still kind of okay, um, you know, depending on where you are. So most of the plebeians live lives kind of, uh, 
kind of like someone in the early 20th century. They might have electric lights or air conditioning, they might have a TV, uh, which of course is later in the 20th century, but whatever. They might have some form of entertainment, um, but they don't have ray guns and lasers and they're not getting the cool medicine that lets you live for centuries. Um, but by and large, they live pretty reasonable lives. Because we talk about all these empires from history like they were terrible places. All oh, the Romans crucified people. Well, not everyone, right? Most Roman citizens live perfectly well, right? They used to say that uh, someone could carry a gold plate on their head, right, around the entire Mediterranean and never be attacked during the reign of Augustus because there was peace, right? These empires get a bad rap sometimes. Um, and so some of this was obviously inspired by the, by the Roman system, but there are other influences too. Uh, the, the Qing dynasty in late China had this really um, articulated, complex system of corporal punishment. Um, if you committed crime X, you know, you would have punishment Y, which was like your hand would be taken off. Or you'd be whipped X times, no more than Y, right? Very, very regimented, and that, that's an influence too on the... On the system. Is that where the, uh, the, the, I remember at one point you had this bit about the, the chantry had a specific index of oh, crimes. Of punishments. And, like, yeah, yeah. and it was the, something very specific. It was like, this kind of rebellion occurring on this kind of starship, if you're at this rank, has this, uh, yeah, this it, precise it's, punishment. It's very, yeah, and, and legal systems get like that over time. I mean, look at our regulatory codes for like where you can and can't put a house. It's insane. Mm. Um, it's way too much. Like some regulation, great. We don't want people doing whatever they want because usually whatever people want is crazy. Um, but so, but you can go too far the other way too. And so yeah, there's a bit in the book where it's like, oh yeah, your punishment for you know whatever this is is going to be ten lashes. And then he like in an aside just says, actually, it's no more than five. I checked because <laughs> um, uh, he was going to be an expert in that sort of thing anyway. So right. Um, so yeah, there are all sorts of historical influences. The the Solon Empire, the empire in the books, is pretty self consciously. I don't want to say LARPing, like you know, playing uh, these historical roles, but they are certainly aware of our history, and they are aware of the symbolic power of things from history. So they'll borrow stuff from Rome, and they know they're borrowing something from Rome because the symbolic language of that speaks to people almost like on a fundamental level. Interesting. Uh, one of the places I think you use that very effectively, and I hope to see, I hope as more is coming as we go deeper in the series, is the uh, the Arthurian legend. Oh yeah, there's way out. more. Oh good, because I, I just, I, I, and I don't want to give too many details on here because people need to go read the books, but I, I love the idea that this empire really got its start in kind of almost an Arthur figure who is... Push, who is taking? Who uh, def who defeats the the AI? The machines, yeah. Machines, in ancient yeah. history, yes. Uh, the uh, the Earth had been taken over completely by machines that were designed to fix all of our problems, and they didn't because they couldn't fix all of our problems because we still die, um, and that caused them to take increasingly drastic measures. And so, yeah, the empire was founded by. It was actually the last king of Britain. Um, who was, by cosmic happenstance, happened to be one of the few people who was still around and was like, my ancestors used to be great, right? Like, I'm going to live up to their legacy, save humanity from the monsters, and I'm going to build, you know, whatever I can from the ashes. And he ends up building this giant empire that, um, that spans a third of the galaxy and is ruled for 15,000 years. Um, if any nation was going to do that, I would not be surprised that if it would it be was a British Britain. It's, monarch. They, yeah. You know, they need, they need another good period, man. I have a tough run right now. Huh? Uh, so, now, I was also really fascinated by your use of time here. Because you, I mean, most novels are focused on a particularly short span of time. And yours both are within a vast span of time. Yeah, I kind of told Aristotle to take a hike. <laughs> Um, you, you didn't like that whole your novel should be like a day in the life. Or... He, he's not wrong. You're, you know, my interpretation of unity of time, which I was probably talking about with your students, right, is that you need the smallest amount of time that you need. Um, and oh, okay. and you know, Aristotle obviously was like, oh, I should do it in a day. But let's remember that Aristotle was not a writer. He was everything. <laughs> That's so true. But he he basically went he and saw and he, that in common. He they went and saw writers. Sophocles, right? And he was like, this stuff is so great. I'm going to write a book about how to do it. I think he's wrong in a couple places. And I think the unities are very good advice, especially if you're starting out. Because if you can tell a great story, uh, it's easier to do it in a small amount of time, especially on stage. In a small amount of time, with as few characters as possible. Don't add extra stuff for no reason, right? So he's definitely right about all of that. 
but I can't tell the story in 10 minutes. Uh, I, need, I need a lot of time, and because space is so big, right, it, ta it would take uh, decades just to get to the closest star, which is 4.3 light years away, um, if not longer with the current technology we have. Um, if we were to use something like the Daedalus rocket with all the atomic propulsion that um, uh, we, you know, has been floated around as an idea, it would still take like 50 years. Um, not to the people who are on the ship, of course, because Einstein, you know, relativity is weird stuff, which I try to avoid um, by doing, you know, Star Trek, you know, warp drive, hyperspace mm -hmm, kind of thing. Mm -hmm. um, but I still want this sense of, uh, of hugeness to the universe because it is huge. And if you go the other way, I love Star Wars, but they can jump to whatever planet they want in 10 seconds. And when you can do that, why are you in space at all? You don't get anything from that distance. It just looks cool, right? Planets in Star Wars may as well be cities in America. They're so close to one another. Um, and if you can have journeys that take 30 years that people have to be frozen for, right, then you have questions like who's still awake, right? Are those people getting older around them? Are we losing people, right? Uh, it really uncouples people who sail in space from time and place. They mm -hmm. start drifting. You know, uh, there's a character in a short story I wrote who signed up for the military knowing he would never see his family again. Mm. Um, because that's usually what the Empire will do is they'll offer uh, a huge stipend for you to join under the condition that you, you know you're never going to see anybody again. So he knows he's like a great-grandfather 12 times over, um, but he's never, he's never getting home. Um, Hadrian doesn't care about that so much because home is not a place he wants to be. Um, but there are characters in book three uh, that he leaves early in the book and comes back to, for example, okay. just, no spoilers, who have just gotten a bit older. And be, this is part of why the nobles live for hundreds of years, I was too. I say, it seems is, like that fits really well. That but... was a convenient way for me to sort of bypass that, right? Yeah. So, like, yeah, I can still leave characters here. It, the difference between being 720 and 740 is not that much, right? Because um, you age... Your perception of time gets faster, right? So they, they, it's no big deal. And they age slowly, so it's like, oh, yeah, there's, it's been like a year for them, right? It's a long time, but whatever. But that also seems to explain then why I, mean, I was fascinated by it throughout book two. Hadrian wants to keep these people with him that he brought with him who become part of the Red Company and everything. Yeah. And so at that very end, and he keeps them with him as he's off to the, the what I'm assuming is the main place where book three is going to be set. But... Uh, that that so he's he's really the his his family is much less about who he's born to as it is about this self selected community that is yeah. kind of more together across time. Yeah. So I'm a big actual family person. I love my family. I, I know a lot of people don't have that luxury, and and sometimes they're right because their family is terrible, and sometimes they're wrong because they're terrible. Because um, very often people who are like my family are awful, they're actually the problem, mm, um, sure. and they don't have the awareness, right? But there are people, you know, there are, everybody gets some friends, right? Or at least hopefully everybody gets some friends. That's not true of everyone, um, unfortunately. But you find other people in your life that are as good as family. And sometimes they're better than. And Hadrian is not someone who fits in with his family at all. Um, he has a tutor, right, that, he, that he's very close with. Mm -hmm. um, and his mother is distant but wait, doesn't. Wait, wait, real quick. You said your friend yes, yeah, yeah. is Gibson? Yes. And the so tutor is every, Gibson? Yes. Everyone, okay. the, the tutor is the scoliasts. They're like a monastic order of scientists. Right. They all name themselves after old scholars um, when they become basically baptized, when they graduate. Uh, and Hadrian's tutor is named after my friend um, uh, because Marcus has done all this help with me with all the philosophy and stuff. Uh, actually, there's a there's a bit in book two. You'll blink it and, and you'll miss it. Where Hadrian looks up in the room, he's writing a story and at a bunch of busts of uh, other scholars, and one of them is the original Gibson. It's supposed to be a bust of my friend. Uh, I describe him as looking like a befuddled vampire because that is what Marcus looks like. He's got the widow's peak, and he just vaguely confused all the befuddled time. Befuddled vampire. Uh, Marcus is he's a great guy, but he uh, yeah that was a that was a nod to him. One of the things I just, as you were saying that, Ryan, I want to circle back around to that I thought um, I, I'm very much interested in the philosophy of human person and how do we define what makes a human person and what rights and responsibilities are entailed in personhood. Tricky stuff. It is. It is. Uh, but definitely, I, I thought some of the more, most interesting philosophical passages were where you were discussing, you have Hadrian really meditate on whether or not he's still human. 
He's at the point where they can't reproduce naturally, and there is he himself just as inhuman as the homunculi, which are clearly and recognizably less lesser versions of humanity. Right, yeah. Homunculi are, uh, they're like replicants from Blade Runner, right? They're artificial people who are grown to a task. So they very often will have weird abnormalities, right? Like there's a character in book two who can photosynthesize, so she's green. Um, and she was made that way so that they wouldn't have to uh, feed a slave labor force because um, they could just get sunlight, right? Um, and there are other ones who can like breathe underwater because they're grown to work underwater. Um, some people will do this to themselves voluntarily, um, uh, especially outside of the empire. Um, but Hadrian's entire cast are artificially uh, altered. They are only not considered homunculi legally. Um, in any practical sense, they are of course homunculi, right? Because they are, are artificially engineered. They still they look like people. They are you know very tall, handsome, you know smart people who live for a very long time. But they have been designed to be that way. Uh, and so they share a lot in common with, with homunculi. And some homunculi can even have children naturally. So some of them are even better off than, than he is, right? Like his friend Ilex probably can have kids. I haven't thought about it. Um, uh, who is a, the, the green lady. Um, and so the fact, that, and this is something my editor was just, was like, this sounds completely arbitrary. This doesn't mean, and like, it is completely arbitrary. That's the, 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 human societies are full of arbitrary distinctions. And there's no problem with that. And it took a really long back and forth with my editor to finally like, communicate that, yeah, Hadrian's asking this question because I want you to realize there's not really a difference. Because a lot of Hadrian's journey is he has to, under, he has to unlearn a lot of um, his sort of uh, inbuilt cultural prejudices. He may learn a new set of them, um, which is another story. But he, has to, he, he starts to realize that the distinctions between kinds of humanity um, don't matter as much when there is an external threat like the aliens hmm. um, who are way more dangerous. Um, and so it doesn't matter, you know, squabbling over whether or not you're more genetically modified than me or vice versa on who outranks whom, right? It's like, it doesn't matter which one of us is an aristocrat if you're in the Middle Ages and you've got an army of Turks coming at the door. If I'm a better commander, you want me on the front line. Whether or not my dad was a pig farmer, right? All these distinctions... Because um, because classical societies, hierarchical societies, uh, can ossify, right? Uh, aristocracy um, has this problem, right, where um, the next, the first generation who sets up the aristocracy, that guy might be awesome, right? Because he fought for it, he made himself king because he's brilliant, he's ruthless, he's extremely competent. His kid is a spoiled brat. We see this in stories all the time, right? Robert Baratheon earned. His kingship. Now, Robert was a usurper and a uh, layabout and, you know, a womanizer and kind of a douchebag. But he wasn't as bad as Joffrey, right, in Game of Thrones, right? And um, the next generation will mess this up. You see this historically all the time. Augustus was probably the greatest administrator who ever lived, right? He established the Roman Empire. He, he expanded it dramatically. He transitioned it from a democratic system to a more autocratic one. It was still technically a republic. Um, but he did all of that, and then Tiberius kind of blew that all away. Caligula tried to fix it, and then um, you know got stopped at. Every, he's not crazy. Uh, he got stopped at every turn, and then was written badly about. Mm. Um, but Nero completely ruined it. Nero was the last descendant of Julius Caesar, and he was an idiot. Um, he may not have been as twisted as history says he was, but he was a terrible emperor. Um, and you, you see this all the time. Marcus Aurelius. Brilliant. His son Commodus, a mistake. Um, and um, all these systems sort of uh, will, will do this. And Hadrian needs to realize as he, as he gets older that the class system, even the, because he's at the top of it, he has a responsibility to be a good person, right? He has a responsibility to his, his subordinates. He needs to be a good leader. He has to have what the medievals called noblesse oblige, an obligation of nobility, you know, and treat the people under him with respect, which is something that a lot of people who are in places of authority don't do because they're not good rulers, mm -hmm. right? Um, and so he learns how to be that and how to look past the sort of, like, you know, he works with homunculi and, and peasants and misfits and all these people because they're good at what they do. 
but he also doesn't abandon this idea that he's competent because he's, he, is, he is born at the top of the system. And so he might be someone who doesn't fit in the system properly, but he, is, he doesn't throw the system out completely. So there's a stewardship responsibility it, that he has. Everyone, but there's also yeah. like a right kind of critique and a maturity and understanding that maybe there are times when the system it needs to be more flexible than he initially thought. Right. You see this all the time, right? When there's a really bad king historically, like I said, he gets killed, right? And historically, we just put a new king in his place, right? Because that system worked. And it did. For most of the Middle Ages, it worked great. Eventually, hit the French Revolution, and we just killed them all. Massacred them. And the French massacred hundreds of priests, too. It was an mm. absolute catastrophe. The only reason it wasn't as bad as the Russian Revolution is because communism hadn't been invented yet. The um, French Revolution was a nightmare. Um, and it was replaced with a terrible rational, air quotes, democracy mm -hmm. that murdered way more people than the king ever did. Um, and then it collapsed into dictatorship. And I'm a big fan of Napoleon um, because I look a lot like him. Um, <laughs> but uh, he was a dictator. Um, you know, he crowned himself. He didn't receive his crown from the right. Pope. Or he didn't receive his crown from God, right? Which, if you don't believe in God, fine. But what that means is those medieval kings who were getting their, their kingship from God... Uh, air quotes, if you like, um, were re recognizing there was an authority more than them. Napoleon didn't recognize a higher authority, right? And so these systems do sour if you don't keep uh, things in perspective, if you don't behave properly. And a lot of what Hadrian's trying to do is figure out, because he's a really rebellious kid. He wants to buck the system and tear it all down, and he wants to make friends with the aliens. And, and he realizes, oh, actually, the aliens are dangerous, aliens. like really dangerous. <laughs> Uh, I was wrong to, uh, you know, uh, you know, to, to sort of think I can be friends with them. But I was also wrong to think that all these people were beneath me. I that by the end of book two, I, I found myself often being very sympathetic to Hadrian's desire to talk with the alien. Uh, and I was thinking that in terms particularly of, uh, I'm, I'm sure you're familiar with the, the phrase, the other with a capital O. Yeah. And I don't know if this was your intent or not, but it seemed to me that the Cielsen are an obvious other. And uh, in that context, it seems like Hadrian has a desire to move towards the other. And yet what he discovers at the end, by the end of book two is that the other is actually completely and utterly different than him. Right, because they're such, not human. Yeah, they're not human. It's such that it... Uh, it, it uh, reminded me a little bit of uh, kind of the way Orson Scott Card frames the uh, the uh, the bugger wars or his more polite I forget uh, the formic war was formic his more wars, polite yeah. war, uh, war term for that later on yeah but the the form where the the idea was we can't both coexist so we're going to kill the enemy rather than be killed and Hadrian kind of realizes that really that that is his relationship to this other by the conclusion of book two that is basically where he, he has to go yeah because look I think. That there is no, there may be individual people who are not savable, right? Serial killers, Hitler, whatever. Um, there are no groups of people who are un, or who are irredeemable, right? Um, there are, you know, uh, Red Guard soldiers who left the communist army and became decent people, right? They weren't doing terrible things. The German police forces in Poland were normal police officers who were asked to do these horrific things when they got over there. Um, and a lot of those people, you know, like um, Werner von Braun the, the, was a Nazi rocket scientist. He also built the Saturn V that took us to the moon, right? There, there's no category of human being, I think, that is beyond redemption. That's a very Catholic way of thinking, and I am. I am Catholic. Um, there are no individuals who are really beyond redemption. There may be people that we can't deal with, right? There's this, uh, I forget who it was, a medieval philosopher said, the reason that we execute criminals is because we can't help them. Only God can. Um, hmm. And I forget who said that. But aliens aren't people. And I wanted to tell a story um, some, uh, about what happens when there is an other that is totally irreconcilable. Now, the Cielsen look a lot like us. And they can talk, and we can talk to them, but they don't think the way we do because they don't come from the same environment at all. Um, there are some aliens who we can't communicate with, who look completely different that we can't do anything with. And there are aliens in book three, where you'll see here soon, that we can work with, uh, that like us, that we can get along with, even if they look very different. 
Um, and so I've got a bit of everything in here, but the Sielsen are the, the, the main villains in this series. Well, one of two. Um, and um, and they, we, we can't bridge that gap, right? And that's the, that's the crux of book two. So we're, I guess we're giving a little bit away, but that's so, right. I don't mind. I'm not, a, I'm not a big believer in spoilers. Um, and I'm not telling you what happens, just, right. just that, you know, this shift. That, that strikes me as a really important kind of element to have. Because I know, so for the past three years, I taught 10th grade logic. And one of the issues that our logic textbook would often bring up is the classical and medieval distinction between humans who have souls and beasts that do not. And my students never agree with me. That, that humans have souls, and this is why we have reason, and animals don't have souls. They might have some ability to operate on – they operate on instinct, and they can communicate in very limited ways, but not in a way that we can definitively say, that right there, that, ant, that dog reasoned its way to – Right. This is an Aquinas thing. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Thomism. Uh, not to go deep Catholic on you, but uh, – but, but Yeah. yeah. It's, it's, we yeah. talk about uh, – he draws the distinction between human, beast – or uh, it's – Bestial, angelic, and uh, I guess human and, intellect. And there's some there's some demonic stuff too, but not in Aquinas. But there is a space for this, um, because there actually, and this is really funny. Uh, one of my friends is a Catholic priest up in uh, Pennsylvania, and he's pretty old school hardcore, right? And he's also a big sci-fi guy. So he's like, if aliens exist, they're either people who are out there in the sky for whatever reason, um, other humans, or they're demons. Um, <laughs> And he's he got his tongue a little bit in cheek when he says this, but this idea that aliens may be to an extent rational but not human, they don't have the they're not made in the image of God, so to speak, theologically, means they're probably demons, is at absolute minimum very metal. Um, and I think that's really cool. You know, putting putting the religion aside, that's really awesome and that's a cool story. And so this idea that the aliens basically are demons in the sense that they are not good, they are not your friends, and you can't reconcile with them, um, was sort of the, the impetus behind this, the, these particular aliens. Because so. they're, they're very, the idea that you can go out there, right, and make peace with this other species is extremely seductive, right? Um, in the way that, you know, classically demons are seductive, they're, they tempt you, right, to make mistakes, mm, right? Okay. And to sin means to make a mistake, right, in Greek. Mm -hmm. And so to, hey, to miss the mark, it's like an archery To miss, term. yes, miss an archery right. thing. Um, literally to miss, which is actually kind of a nice way to think about it. You're not doing something evil, you just, you missed. Um, and, uh, and so Hadrian makes this mistake, right? His mistake is, oh, I can go out there and reason with these guys. No. He's got, I mean, he has a little bit of hubris in him, too, because he's going to do what no one else has done. Yeah, he, he thinks... 400 years this war's been going on, and no one else has dared to have this conversation. That's every kid, right? You're 18, sure. and you're like, how did adults get us to this place? This world's stupid. It sucks, man. I remember being that kid, right? I was like, I'm going to go, I'm going to go fix everything. No, I'm not. I, I'm a kid. I'm 18. That doesn't mean, you know, that kids are, you know, dumb or something, but it... it it's because they're not, you know, everyone. But there's really, a passion there that's not really mediated. By, or, by facts, yeah. yeah. And I don't want to talk down anyone because kids, you know, I mean, I, I'm only barely not a kid. And kids can do a lot of great things, right? And, and there are a lot of young people historically have done amazing things, right? Alexander was only 23 when he defeated the Persian Empire. What have I done? I'm 26, right? What? I haven't defeated any empires. That's the, I'm, I am so behind, <laughs> right? Um, and he get, Mozart, right, did most of his composing uh, before he was even 20, right? And, and so we shouldn't put down people because they're young. But when you are a kid, you think, oh, wow, you know, these problems are easy, right? Anybody can fix them. And you can maybe fix a small part of it. The world's too big, especially now. It's too big and complicated. And Hadrian thinks he can fix a galaxy, right? He's 19. Of course he can fix a galaxy. And he's going to find, of course, that that's By the time harder. he's 1,500 and he's still trying, uh, you know, yeah. Well, 
I have two last questions for you on the on on the Sun Eater series. Um, the first is I was fascinated by you did a very what strikes me as a very classical thing in that uh, you give Hadrian moments where either he's meditating on what has happened, he's thinking to himself, or he kind of breaks from his active persona and he's more playing the narrator role. Yeah. And in it, when it, when those sort of moments happen, he gives these very pithy wisdom statements. Uh, so where where do you draw those kind of moments from? All sorts of places, primarily through Marcus, um, because I, I'll be like, look, I'm trying to talk about, you know, virtue, right, or whatever. Um, what do you got? And then he will throw off his office. Like, like Marcus can sight read ancient Greek, right? Ah, oh, like those he's, guys. Yep, yeah, yep. he's he's brilliant. So uh, he'll pull some source that most, like, everybody's heard of Socrates, but he'll pull something, like, deep, right, and be like, how about this, right? And then so I'll either work with that, I'll either cite it directly and have, like, oh, yes, Epictetus, um, you know, um, or I'll just take what they say and then reword it in some way. Um, sometimes it's just stuff that uh, I got from someone I know. Um, y y when you're writing, you want to be open to... Any possibility, right? So you always want to be, you're always kind of researching, you're always listening. Um, when I have characters tell, like, war stories, they're usually war stories I've heard from actual soldiers that I'm friends with, right? Because um, the publisher I work for publishes a lot of veteran writers. Mm, um, and okay. so I will take stuff from them. Um, and that's totally okay. Um, and then so sometimes, too, um, you know, I, I'll just make it up because it'll be what I'm trying to say. Um, I, I'm, uh, I'm a big fan, too, of, uh, like, Carl Jung, um, Jungian psychology, symbolism, uh, writers like Mircea Eliade, who's a religious scholar, does a lot of stuff about shamanic symbolism, things like that. Uh, more recently, Jordan Peterson. Okay. Um, who, um, I met, actually. Really? Um, yeah. What's he like in person? Uh, he actually is like he is. Uh, he's extremely intense. But uh, I did get the sense that he, I, I, I don't, a lot of people think he's some sort of charlatan. I think he really cares um, about all of these people. Um, now, he can't obviously care about everybody, but he was really nice. Um, I had a really good time. I went to one of his talks a couple of years ago. Um, it was cool. Cool. Um, but he, he's done this great job trying to marry the Jungian symbolic psychology to biology um, mm. in his book, Maps of Meaning. Uh, okay. Which is both an excellent uh, biological psych text and and a symbolic one, and it's it bridges a lot of gaps. Whether or not it's true is less interesting to me again as an artist than whether or not it works artistically. Okay. Um, and so, you know, that's cool. But I think it's a really tough book. It's really long. Uh, but uh, that, or gosh, Jung's even tougher, right? Try reading Answer to Job. Um, it's a short. I've not, I've not read much. I've not ever read Jung. Uh, I've read a Legion yeah. of Freud and a Jung, touch of Skinner, you know, but never Jung. Yeah, you know Nietzsche is hard to Piaget. Um, so a lot of those guys, I'll try to read and even you know, uh, and, and do my best with. Right, and other other literature, of course, I get in trouble because I reference I reference Aeschylus, Sophocles, Shakespeare. Nobody gives me any trouble. There's a bit in the book right where she, uh, Hadrian goes and he he leaves his father's palace and he encounters uh, poverty, death. And disease, just like the Buddha does. Saying, Nobody's okay. like, Christopher, you stole the Buddha's origin story. <laughs> but if I make one <laughs> reference to Star Wars, people like plagiarism, you stole... Like, no, you, one, I know you all are not reading any great books. You're just watching Star Wars. <laughs> so I know where my audience is at. And I love you guys, but not the guys who are hitting the plagiarism button. Those guys, not so much. But, like, I, I'll reference, you know, Star Wars, Dune. Uh, there's a couple... Uh, uh, like Name of the Wind things, so like people are like, oh, he's copying Patrick Rothfuss. No, I have the same editor, and I thought an Easter egg would amuse Betsy, right? Like, ah. you know, so I'll, I'll reference this. Whatever book you read, whatever movie you're watching, there's something in there, even if it's a bad movie that you could take away from it. Um, and so I'm, oh, I don't know where I get individual things anymore. There's just so much rattling around. Well, I, we, we use a particular pedagogy around at Thales called Socratic Seminar, where we'll, we'll take a, cl a particularly rich passage of whatever text we're reading, and we'll dig into that with a lot of Q&A as a class. And uh, as I was reading this, I, I don't expect to ever, um, uh, in, unless my wildest dreams come true and I'm given a sci-fi fantasy literature elective in some future year, 
which I don't think will ever happen, but it would be cool. Uh, but your, uh, your book just struck me as like, there are lots of passages where I'd want to stop and let's really dig into this. Cause there's, I love finding those places that are simultaneously philosophically interesting, comprehensible, and yet applicable to teenagers. And that's, that's a hard spot to hit, but your book was filled with these like nuggets of like, oh, let's just stop and think about these two or three lines. And most of them I don't think were you. Maybe many of them were, but I think you were bringing forward some some older idea that was just like really succinct and well said. Sometimes, sometimes I, I sometimes I'm accidentally brilliant. Yes, yes. It's never on purpose, <laughs> right? You know. <laughs> um, but that's sort of the thing I was talking about, right? Because that's three lines, and you can talk about it for two hours. Yeah. Right. Yeah. And it's not me, just me, but it's it's a lot of writers, right? That's the writing. You know, it's a hundred words saying. 2000, right? So that picture is beat any day of the week. Uh, mm, so good. Well, uh, where, where is the story going from here? We've got two books. You've mentioned number three. There are going to be five. Five books. Uh, so the third one, Demon in White, uh, is almost done. I'm writing a huge battle scene. We've got, you know, uh, C. Elson lined up, you know, humans on the other side, giant robots, because uh, I know we're talking about all the philosophy. There are giant robots here, right? <laughs> there are swords that can cut through anything. There are ray guns. There are spears. Um, there are flying metal snakes. Um, you know, there's a bunch of crazy stuff I have to deal with. Um, and, uh, you know, this huge spaceship blocks out the sun. There's a lot going on. And so I have to get through all that. And then I've got to do book four because the torture never stops, to quote Frank Zappa. Uh, okay. Is it's it's treadmill, man. Yeah. Like I said, if I wanna if I wanna get there, if I wanna beat somebody, I gotta I gotta keep writing. Well, as one of your uh, at least new fans, I, I know I'm I'm literally about four weeks ago I found your books over at Wake County Public Library in uh, Nightdale, and uh, I, I I'm definitely a fan. I, I please do keep on on the treadmill and uh, keep churning them out. And we'll do with quality over uh, time. Yeah, don't want to rush, but I also don't want to take ten years. Well, let's move to a slightly different area and begin kind of probably wrapping this up because uh, I, I appreciate your time today. I know we're, we're probably running a little long. I am okay. Oh, that's good. Yeah, that's fun. So uh, I, as far as I can tell, the audience for our show is mostly middle schoolers and high school students. We're aiming at those who are involved in competitive debate, but I think we also pick up uh, various folks who are interested in the different topics that we discuss. Uh, so – with that in mind, um, I know I have several – I have a few students who have already – they've told me this year they're currently writing their, their first novel or, or maybe maybe it's novel two or three. But they've currently got novels awesome. that are cooking. Uh, That's what I started. What advice would you give to young aspiring authors somewhere in middle school or high school? So actually George Martin uh, asked him the same question, uh, George R. R. Martin, Game of Thrones. And uh, he asked me if there was any way – uh, he could convince me not to be a novelist, which was a weird thing to hear from the guy who wrote Game of Thrones. And I said, well, no. And he's like, good answer. Um, because it's, it's hard, right? Especially if you want to produce uh, a lot because you have to write every day. And if you want to get published, that's what you have to do, even if there's no finish line in sight. Um, set a goal that you can hit every single day. If that's 2,000 words, which is about what I have to do a day to get a book out in a year, great. If it's a thousand, do a thousand. If it's only a hundred words, do a hundred words. Um, I talked to this young lady at a convention um, a couple weeks ago who was trying to write a story um, about some, basically about her own life and some trauma she'd been through, but she couldn't do it because it was really traumatic. And I told her, if all you can write is a sentence a day, it's enough. Um, because a sentence a day, uh, day after day, will be a book eventually. And if that's all you can manage, right? Because you guys are busy. You got homework. You got sports teams. Uh, I'm sure you know. Uh, Josh has given you plenty to do. Lots, um, lots of reading. Lots, lots of, of reading. reading. You know, and your parents are making you do stuff, and that's never fun. Um, but you want to do this, and this is true if you're drawing or doing music or whatever. You have to do it every day, even if it's just for ten minutes, um, because it's the only way you can get there. You can't be someone who talks about writing and be a writer. Um, you have to do it. Um, practically speaking, then uh, you can publish with Amazon. That's one way to do it. Um, that's a whole other podcast. Um, so is finding an agent. But the most important thing you can be doing right now is practicing because you already know how to tell a story. You tell stories to your friends all the time. You've got plot and characters down. What you don't have down is sentence structure. What you don't have down is style. And the only way to get there is to practice. You have to read a lot and you have to write more, right? Um, 
you know what good sentences sound like, you've read them, right? Write ones like that, even if you have to copy. Um, you may have to change just one word at a time. Um, practice your voice. Um, throw work away. Don't be afraid to throw it away. Um, you've got time right now. You guys are, what, middle school, high school? Um, plenty of time, right? I thought I was going to be like Christopher Paolini, Aragon, right, and finished 15. Um, <laughs> Those books are so bad. I, I, they have their issues. Christopher is a really nice guy. I'm sure he is. Um, he, they're not, they're not the best books in the world, um, but he did them at 15. Yeah. By God, and that told me that I could do it. And you know, he published a book that's you know, it's 200,000 words when he was 15 years old, and he is an international bestseller, right? So those books may not be great, but boy, does he sell me under the table. And he did it when he was 15, and that you know, if he can do it, you can too. Um, but you have to, you have to practice at it. And it is work, and it's not always going to be fun. I have to go back and write right now, and I would really rather play the new Zelda game. Um, <laughs> but it's not happening. I, I'm going to do that in a couple months, because I've got to finish this book. So, write. Keep writing. And don't yeah. be afraid to suck. Right? It's okay to write bad writing. Um, just throw it out. Nobody has to read it. Um, and you can tell it's bad writing when you read it out loud and it sounds stupid to yourself. Um, I still do that, and I still throw things away. I had a writing. We had a we had a paper in my literature class last year, or not last year, last semester. And I had students who they I came in one day, and they were like, "So I can be like 300 words over your word count limit, right?" Like, no, 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 because there's 48 of you. I have to read 48 1,200 word essays on the same topic. So no, you can't write me 1,600 words. I had one student who was convinced that there was nothing in the paragraphs that could be trimmed. And we went through and we trimmed. I have writers like that, and they're always wrong. <laughs> um, even if you're just cutting out adverbs, because let me tell you what, you almost never need an adverb. Oh, adjectives, adverbs, so many times you can get rid of those. Yeah. Um, especially Thanks, do, in an essay. Do you have writers who, who love the passive voice? I love the passive voice. What? The passive voice is great. Well, um, please make your case. Uh, it's Why is the passive voice Purely aesthetic. You shouldn't use it in an action sentence. Um, if you're, you shouldn't, you know, hit something, you should hit something as opposed to the thing was hit by me. But there are plenty of times where you need the passive voice because it's appropriate. Um, we have this thing against it for some reason. It's, uh, it's purely aesthetic. Um, when you're writing fiction, there are places it belongs. The middle of a sword fight is not one of them. But if you want, if there, but if you've got a character who's meditating, you know, passively, uh, there are places that that is applicable. There are places you can use second person in narration. You probably shouldn't. Um, but the thing about writing creatively is that a lot of these didactic rules, right? Like you can split infinitives. There's no reason that you can't. The reason that we don't split infinitives in English is because you can't split an infinitive in Latin. Um, and the grammarians in the 1700s who... Uh, they wanted to make English more like Latin, so that you can't split infinitives. But in English, infinitives are two words. If I want to boldly go where no man has gone before, <laughs> by God, I will. That's better than to go boldly. Um, or if not better, it sounds different, right? There's a different meter to it. Mm -hmm. And there are always reasons like that, you know, like, the, like the, just the pure sound of the language um, where a sentence phrase passively might be more effective. Not necessarily. But that's something that you can think about. In an essay, maybe not, right? In an essay, you don't want either passive or active. You want as many linking verb sentences as possible. Um, you want, you know, hmm. thing X is supporting statement uh, because thing Y. You don't need, you know, this uh, article hit the press. You, know, you don't. You're not writing creative nonfiction. Academic writing is so much linking sentences. Um, hmm. I don't think about that. Well, that's, a, that's, that's interesting. So you're suggesting that so much of it depends on the context and the tone that you're trying yeah, to Yeah, and if you're writing fiction, a lot of the didactic stuff like that sure. totally doesn't matter. Um, it, that doesn't mean that you should go, again, do not write an action scene in passive voice. You better have a really good reason for doing that. Uh, but there are places where the odd sentence or two is not going to be a problem. I do it all the time. Well, let me ask you one last advice question. Cool. Uh, so again, thinking of middle schoolers and high schoolers, though this time more particularly to our actual podcast audience of students who are competing in public speaking and debate. As an author, what advice would you give them about writing, communication, and argumentation? Read your work aloud. 
um, which I did touch on a little bit. Um, but especially if you're giving a speech that you're going to be reading out loud, read it out loud. Because um, people didn't actually used to read in their heads. Um, this is a pretty recent evolution. Um, there are stories about Julius Caesar reading silently in front of uh, people who would be brought into his tent when he was on campaign to scare them. Um, it was this kind of magic. Um, and uh, so good, effective writing, especially rhetorically, if you're giving a speech, if you're making an address, if you're in debate, must sound good. It's not just a function of the words on the page, it's a function of how you say them um, and the way you move your hands, right? Um, which you can't see, but I'm doing constantly. Um, because the gestures and the way you're speaking, the pattern you're speaking, the, uh, the rhythm of your words um, are as much a critical component of the writing. And this is true in fiction, too. Um, I listen to a lot of audiobooks, um, and so my style is very voiced. Uh, if you read what I'm writing, it, I don't know if you did the audiobook by chance, but it sounds, I think, better aloud than written. Because hmm. um, often you read a sentence and it's like 12 lines long, right? If you're reading Faulkner, you're like, this makes no sense. But if you read it out loud, you get it. This is like kids don't like Shakespeare because it's old writing. But then you read it out loud, and like, oh, no, that made sense. I don't know what foison means, but that made sense. I can kind of figure it out from context. Um, so read everything out loud because uh, you need to practice the out loud component of your speech anyway. But it will catch any mistakes you make, even generic typos, right? Because you'll be reading like... Oh, that's that's the wrong word. Um, I hit I said do instead of to. Ha! Huh, what a fool I am. Um, you'll catch all of that, but you'll also like wait a minute. I can punch that up a little bit, make it stronger, right? I you know I, I had two things here. If I had a third one, it would hit that much harder. You can hear all of that because your ear is smarter than you are. Well, that is some great advice, uh, Christopher. Thank you so much for coming on the show. Thanks today. for having me. Ladies and gentlemen, thank you as well for tuning in to this special bonus episode of What's the Res? Listeners, do take my advice. Buy yourself a copy of Empire of Silence and Howling Dark today so that you're ready whenever book three comes out and eventually book four and book five. You won't be disappointed by this series. If you haven't already, be sure to subscribe to our normal podcast feed to get notifications about our new episodes. We try. We, we don't always hit it, but we try to release episodes three times a week. Normally, our episodes are focused on resolution analysis for high school debate. We focus on public forum, Lincoln Douglas, Coolidge style, and world school debate. We also do support episodes that extend analysis, and we also do interviews with experts who can help sharpen your debate cases. Now, just in case you're like Ethan, Noah, and myself, and you can't quite get enough of debate in your life, then you should check out our premium debates. We have a whole separate channel of debate episodes that we call Real Debates by Real People, where educated non-experts debate the most press pressing issues of the day. We've got nine episodes up currently, and over the next two months, we'll debut episodes on racial reparations and debating the uh, hashtag Yang Gang style universal basic income. You can access those for $3 a month or $30 a year at whatstherez.podbean.com. Thank you for your support, and until next time, work hard, speak well, and seek the truth.